King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents The Broadcasters Podcast, a weekly media commentary talking about traditional and digital media headlines and talking to the content creators out front and behind the scenes. Here is the King of Podcasts. As I start tonight's Broadcasters Podcast, please do not do what Nicki Minaj did this week. And be a little bit careless and reckless with commentary on Twitter and Instagram. Just saying. That's one of the things I've noticed this week, but we're not going to focus on that because there's so much more to talk about. On the program tonight, we are loaded. We're going to go into the area of popular music. The last couple weeks, we've been looking at the rise of Drake and Kanye with their forthcoming albums, which have now been both released. And now we're seeing the domination of the charts that Drake... I didn't. I knew he was going to dominate, but I didn't think he was going to do this good. <laughs> what a complete and utter, you know, devastation to all the other artists that are on the Billboard Hot 100 this week. When all 23 tracks of Drake's album "Certified Lover Boy" made it onto the charts and topped, and I think they all made it into the top 40 with nine of the top 10 songs on the list. Got that to talk about. I did a couple of episodes on one of my podcasting, which focused a little bit on that. First of all, the, the, the total domination of that Billboard chart domination of Drake. I put that up on, my, on the YouTube page. You can go look for it at YouTube.com slash J-B-R-A-S-C-O-9-5-1. YouTube.com slash J-B-R-A-S-C-O-9-5-1. That's where you can go and find it. And I also talked about the MTV Video Music Awards, the VMAs which happened also this weekend. I've already made a little bit of commentary on that so far. And I just want to go into an overall subject of it and talk about how all of this and how popular music is perceived in the pulse of it today. Does MTV still have a pulse of it? See, when you go to other countries, I haven't been, but I want to look at other countries and how they perceive and how they position themselves when it comes to music. It's so different than here. America, it doesn't have the kind of organization, the kind of you know, position that it has, where Billboard is it's recognized, but it's not put on a large-scale platform because their exposure only is to the magazine itself and through what they're doing um, through streaming and through online, and that's it, totally digital. Nothing in the streaming space, nothing where there's any really strong podcasts or radio programs where radio is not even taking a grasp of it. You know me long enough on this show that I always have a problem with how Billboard is no longer recognized by radio, period. When you look at what the Ryan Seacrest America Top 40 countdown is and what that represents, I don't even know if the country countdown does that either, but there's no representation by Billboard who, for their credit, still does the best job of giving us at least what the pulse of popular music is today. Because at least, even though there's manipulation that can be had, even though there is some parts of the algorithm that need to be fixed, we know that. I mean, the fact that radio gets so much of a play, sales get such such a matter. There's all those different underlying factors. But then you also have to go and consider, we don't, there's just certain things that get calculated too much, but at least there's some calculations that are correct when it comes to streaming. When it comes to what TikTok is able to go and create with certain songs to make themselves, you know, rise up into the Billboard charts to get recognized. How older songs will get resurrected back onto the charts. When you look at all that, maybe not so much here, but it definitely does happen nevertheless. When I think in the UK, the official chart there, which is our comparison to Billboard magazine charts, you look at what they did, and I'm thinking about the fact that earlier this year, Heat Waves by Glass Animals was somewhere in the top 20 in its initial run on the charts back uh, at the start of the year. And then it completely just made a rise back up near the top 10 because it was featured on a Netflix show. I mean, all of a sudden, I think it was Never Have Ever or it was something else, but it got featured. And in the UK, you know, if a song is featured on Love On, which is one of the most popular TV series, and the fact that people will still watch shows new on television, regular conventional television, cable TV, 
or rabbit ears because of the fact that the programming, the quality of network programming in every other country is so damn good. That quality of programming, then it gets brought over to streaming, right? Because then the likes of Netflix and Amazon Prime are taking those shows. There's a quality being taken care of. And there's a way to chronicle and analyze who is the best of the best right now. But the thing is, too, is that the popular music and the way it's perceived, the where we are with it, you got to ask yourself the question, I mean, who really has, it's being directed, it's being pushed in different directions. I've always talked about the, well, I've talked most recently about the crossover, the organic crossover, and then there's the mainstream crossover, the perceived crossover. There's that that they're doing. And she so got that that's being part of what's going on and it doesn't show much. And then because radio has a different life and then the same thing with radio here, Rolling Stone, a different thought process. No one's on the same page. Of course, that's what radio is. It's a free country. We have, you know, multiple areas of information. How accurate they are, we're not even sure. But when you look at what's going on, you know, there's a reason why Rolling Stone a couple of years ago decided to put their own top 100 songs on their chart in the same way. They decided to go and put that out there as well. But, you know, it doesn't make much of a difference. You have them and then radio has their own. They have media base. They have, you know, their own charts with their own checking which has nothing to do with billboard so they're completely so when mtv has to go and come in and try to show the best representation of popular music today they have to play kate to both sides which they really they still have to kind of play to an antiquated radio route which is why when you see the artists that were at the top of the charts that all were featured like right now if we're looking at the media based top 40 charts for the week ending september 16th just got put out today you look at who per, who performed at the MTV VMAs. Who will be performing at the iHeartRadio Music Festival? Kid Leroy and Justin Bieber. So Kid Leroy performed. Olivia Rodrigo performed. Ed Sheeran performed. Doja Cat performed. Lil Nas X performed. Lil Nas, uh, so like you have that there. All that across the board. And that's who they're going to go after. Meanwhile, Drake and Kanye, yeah, their eyebrows just came out, but they just got new albums coming out. Nowhere to be seen either one. Not a one. Meanwhile, I mean, at the moment of the, the VMAs, you know, Drake did not have the album come right out right away, but even Kanye West wasn't even considered. But you knew there were going to be a, a big impact. Nothing. Not at all. And that's what they chose to do. And then you look across and you just say, okay, um, it's as if there's just two different worlds, like a bizarre world of what radio says is what it is. And it's a whole manipulation of many different variables. So manipulating with the billboard charts to make money off of that. Meanwhile, radio, I don't know what they're doing and why they continue to control what's being put on their stations. Well, they could just follow billboard. I mean, you want to have the pulse of popular music. Billboard does. But why do people want to neglect what they're doing? Or even the fact that Rolling Stone's 500, well, I mean, or the Rolling Stone 100, why even do that? Why are they also getting, you know, just neglected? Nobody's paying attention to them at all. Like, what good is that? Because at least, even with the charts that they had on the Rolling Stone 500, or the Rolling Stone 100 this week, for the top five songs right off the bat, were Drake. Matter of fact, when it comes to the Rolling Stone chart, their national chart, it's actually seven songs, it looks like, that are, no, eight songs that are tops in their field. Eight songs on the top of the top ten. But even then, there's quite a few similarities to what's going on with what Rolling Stone puts out and what Billboard puts out. 
They have analytics, real numbers. What's MediaBase doing? How are they uh, how are they calculating their information? Only by spins. And we already know across the board they are always late to the game. And they also choose which artists they care to promote. So radio is just a promotional arm. It's not a place to promote. It's just a promotional arm. They are used and no one and that's why nobody cares about radio. That's why radio can't get make any money. They can't make any money off the music labels, they can't or the record labels, they can't make money off of anybody. You know where they make their money? Political ads. A dollar a holler. Yeah, that's really good. That's what they look forward to in November what is it, leading up to November every year. Political ads. And then they might get the the nickel and dime CPM of advertising that comes across. Yeah, I know I'm getting into a radio rant, but they are just getting a little nickel and dime from every insurance company that's out there that wants to go and use their billions of dollars of, of advertising collateral to go ahead and push. And they go, oh, oh, well, we can make a couple of cents here and put it on radio. Maybe a, maybe some fifty year old will be listening. That's what they think. Radio is a joke. It's being treated as a joke. And sure, we're getting a nationalization in some cases. Might as well do that because these corporate radio companies, they don't know what they're doing. They, can't, they cannot micromanage. They, they fail at micromanaging all their stations. And so the music on the radio, where is there is still a place that people, hey, they still what, say 98% of people still listen to radio? Okay. But you're not serving the public at all. You might be serving them with older music that you just play over and over, you know, with a 300 to 500 song playlist, but you're not helping anybody. Of these stations in radio, are they following along with Kanye and Drake? Probably not. Maybe the maybe the urban stations, but it's mainstream now. Automatically, Drake and Kanye they mainstream themselves. Every other country, they're putting them up on the charts. What the official chart says in the UK, BBC Radio plays, and to a, a certain extent, Capital Radio plays, and others. That's what they do. And in other countries, they also have their own respective charts, and they also follow along. So if Kanye and Drake, they put a song and they go worldwide, it goes worldwide. In America, eh, yeah, it does. So there's, you know, this is their disconnect by between, between what radio is, this old, traditional, antiquated medium that needs restructuring, just like everything else. See, the problem with radio is, you know, they don't have anybody backing them. There's no company holding on to them right now to build them up. No, they're all sitting by themselves without much of a digital model. I mean, some podcasting, but that doesn't make enough money like streaming does. But that's exactly what radio and all these radio companies are doing. The audio companies, they're doing podcasting. They're treating it like streaming. They're taking it like a model like every other corporate company like a Disney or a Viacom. That's what they think works or, or Netflix. That's what they think they could do. It's not the same thing. So much different. But they're not going to understand that. And why I even kind of hamper about this. I have to do this. I got to rant somewhere. I got to talk to somebody about it. I don't have anybody that's a close friend that I would go ahead and just rant on this for like a regular point. I wouldn't do this to my peers in the radio industry. I'll just go on a podcast about it on my own podcast. Part of what I need this for is kind of therapy for me. It helps me to go ahead and get through and vent through the vitriol that I have of why things couldn't be better. The wonderful world of media. What can I say? Let's go into some of the headlines we're talking about when it comes to Drake and Kanye and what happened. So now, first of all, I want to talk about the MTV effect before I go into Drake and Kanye. We'll just, we'll start with how the week started. Well, here's, the kind of the dynamic that's very interesting out of all this. MTV had 38 million social media interactions. So people were watching what MTV was posting through all their platforms. What well, they were posting on social media, everybody was responding to. Were they watching the show? No. But the show is good. Hey, MTV, the last two years I've watched, it's been pretty good. I've really, I think they've done a very good job on producing and who they'll be bringing on to go ahead and perform. I think it's been very good. Nothing's felt bad. I mean, you know, there's always a little bit of the cringe worthy, like, uh, you know, some things that might happen over there that just be like, oh, okay. 
the hypersexuality, that's no surprise there. But, you know, the tie-ins, the promotions, or advertising, that was fine. What they did with it, I mean, it was kind of a commercial and a commercial, but music got the showcase. And it was, you know, also showcasing the 40th anniversary of MTV. That all worked really well. I thought it would good. So the show returned to the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York. And with a slight increase in total minutes consumed. The annual award show dropped from 2020. So with everybody there, over all the prog- all the co- coverage that they had, they pulled in over 6. 6. 6.4 million viewers. That was it. Little Nas X, Olivia Rodrigo, Justin Bieber were top winners. Industry Baby, uh, Little Nas X won the Marquee Video of the Year Award for his Montero video. Rodrigo won for Song of the Year, Best New Artist and Push Performance of the Year. Bieber scored the Artists of the Year Award. Foo Fighters winning the Global Icon Award. Billy Eilish winning the Video for Good Trophy for Your Power. Doja Cat pulling, performing and hosting I thought she did a fantastic job. I think she did really good. They had a lot of good performances. It had something for everybody. Alicia, que- Alicia Keys and Sway Lee, Camila Cabello, Chloe, Ed Sheeran, Kid Leroy, Casey Musgraves, Jack Harlow, also with Lil Nas X, Machine Gun Kelly and Travis Barker, Shawn Mendes and Tiny, 21 Pilots, Normani and Ozuna. So it was a good, solid performance. And also they had their push uh, section, which they featured... St. John, they featured the Lotto. Like, all oh, that was really good. But yeah, 38 million interactions, the top social telecast of the year. And people just kept looking. I mean, just, you know, people were just paying attention. Uh, ben Gilmer and Dennis Thieves co founder Jason Injatovic. In, oh, Injatovic. Right. Injatovic. Wow, that's a hard name. Executive produced the VMAs alongside co-executive producer Barb Bielkowski. Hey, good show. Keep the MTV VMAs as they are. You know, we see, you know, something shocking, exciting, fun, interesting. And, you know, I still don't feel bad about the current phase of popular music. The new music that's out there. The one thing that you notice, too, in the performances that they had was a lot of liveliness which is not so much with all the music that's out there, but they definitely pick artists that were going to be exciting, that were going to be... They were, I think they were trying to go and get the younger audience to catch on to what was going on here, but they do need to go and have to stream that somewhere else because the show is simulcast on all cable outlets. They need to stream it. They need to start streaming that show because it's not doing any good by doing it here. So if you've got to go on Paramount Plus or, or just somewhere... MTV needs to put it up on YouTube, something, but they should not be holding it here. They need to be putting out live to everybody. They're not going to MTV. I mean, for me, that's the only time I ever turn on MTV in the first place. I'm not a fan of ridiculousness or Teen Mom or Four Obama Shore. I'm not going to watch all that. So MTV is just not made for me. Not the way it is now. No. As I've been, well, I've been wanting for the last 20 years. What can I say? Now, the show itself, Substream Magazine put out a story, and I have not read from them before, but they took an overall look at what MTV's 40th anniversary, and they tied in the VMAs. So, Marjani Rawls writes, the 40th anniversary of MTV felt anything but the grandiose celebration it deserves. Well, first off the bat, MTV is just not the same channel. But I wish somebody would take the torch of what MTV represents. That's what I think is most important is that, I mean, call me crazy, okay? But when it, came, when it comes to TV or streaming, MTV should best represent. And it doesn't have to be Fuse. It doesn't have to be others. But MTV could do a better job of representing music. But instead, YouTube is doing that and all the streamers are doing that they are representing music in the best possible light and there should be a place to showcase or put a spotlight on various types of popular music that are charting and doing very well 
That's what MTV was. But no one has taken that spot, putting it somewhere streaming or using a radio outlet or something to get that out there. But they're not doing it. It's just not something that's going to happen. Oh, well. So in the story, they talk about how, for many young music lovers, an after-school wind-down meant TRL, where Carson Daly would preside over a studio audience to count down the top 10 songs of that day. A mishmash of genres, reading from the pop songs of Britney Spears and NSYNC, the new metal of Corn and Limp Bizkit, hip-hop anthems from the likes of Diddy, 50 Cent, and Eminem, young millennials would clash and vote each day to get their videos in the number one spot. And then we also had other shows that also accompanied that was part of the MTV lifestyle. Music related. Cribs, Diaries, Album Launch, All Access Week, Yo MTV Raps, Unplugged, and Headbangers Ball. Not that MTV didn't have its non-music programming, but how could you forget the likes of Daria singled out the real world of Beavis and Butthead? The music brought the... Well, let's be honest. I mean, the torch of what MTV's non-music programming... I'm going to say Adult Swim basically took that torch and ran with it because the MTV mentality is in what's on Adult Swim on Cartoon Network. Just saying. The music still brought you to the dance. Everything else was just the delicious topics on the pizza. Now, they mentioned how MTV officially launched August 1st, 1981. Built as the first 24-hour video channel. Video killed the radio star by the Buggles. First ever video. We all know this trivia. What happened to this mecca of music? Well, things change. So they talk about that fact was more apparent during the 40th anniversary of MTV and last night's Video Music Awards. This was, record, this was published the night after on Monday. There was a lack of a bigger celebration to acknowledge what the channel has built outside legendary mainstays like Madonna, Buster Rhymes, and Cindy Lauper. No allusion to classic DJs like Kurt Loder, Tabitha Soren, Fab Five Freddy's, or Downtown Julie Brown. No, they're not going to do any of that. They're not going to go nostalgic on MTV. You could find that somewhere else. Somebody else might go ahead and create a reunion for them, but they're not going to do it on MTV. It's, I mean, it doesn't make sense to go and go celebrate our 40th anniversary and you know, bring everybody back and then just try to do some kind of a, you know, respect retrospective. You could do a documentary about it and put it out, but I don't think MTV could do it themselves. They're not able to do that. They, they're they not capable. Or I don't think Viacom or less could be that capable. I mean, they have the clips, they have the wherewithal, but to be able to take the time and money to create a proper retrospective that everybody would be happy about, an older audience, they're not worrying about that. They carried a business-as-usual approach, both to the award show and MTV's daily programming. A little word given the channel's extensive slate of shows to draw from. I'm not saying bring TRL back. MTV tried in October 2017. It did not work. But to ignore everything that made the channel is a little bit sad. The VMAs used to be a cultural event where everybody turned in. Social media wasn't a prevalent tool during its heyday until later in the 2000s. But people still talked about it. I mean, people knew that was actually happening. But MTV doesn't have the pool to make sure people will go ahead and find the show. Like, you have to go and look around for marketing for that. Like, what they did do was they did push on social media to get people to watch. But I don't think people are going to go out of their way on a Sunday night to watch. Because they can just find the clips later, which MTV put on YouTube. Like, let me put it to you like this. If you go ahead and look at what the performances are, everybody's going to go find what they are on YouTube, and they went back and looked for them. So if I go and look at what they put up, this week well let's look at this four million views for olivia rodrigo's good for you performance if you look there was four uh let's see five million for the little nas x performance 2.8 for justin bieber's performance and the kid Leroy. chloe's performance 3.2 million views and then you have others that are showing of all the different amounts of what people were actually watching and getting into and so that was fine I mean, they were doing just fine all this here, and MTV has some prominence. Nine million viewers on their YouTube channel, among other things that they have. If I look at their Instagram, 15 million followers, that's good. 
but like again, there was all these different places they can go ahead and showcase what they had on. There was no problem there. Plus, they did the same thing with Twitter. 16 million viewers, which is decent for what they're doing. And, and really, what else are they, uh, you know, to have music to showcase one time a year on this channel because it's basically their job to do that. They created this show in 84, 1984. They're the ones that have to do the job. They're the ones that initially started the Video Music Awards. They have to continue the tradition. So they do, to their credit. But it's not just a tradition. It's also that we need to have. We need to have that celebration of music, of popular music. We need to be able to have some place we can go to that is the go-to to discuss, showcase, and spotlight popular artists that everybody goes to. We don't have that now. I mean, MTV was the place. And I mean, if somebody was able to go ahead and do something with MTV now to recreate what they're doing I mean, nobody's ever done it. That's the other problem. Nobody's even tried to do that. Part of it might be because the artists are probably not accessible anymore. Just too much work to get them on. No access to concerts. I mean, I don't know. It's tough. But nobody's working with each other on this either. So music kind of just goes on its own. That's what they're going to do. They just don't care. But they had interaction among all their channels, which they did definitely did. And that's okay. 46 being on YouTube, it's going to be on Facebook. So they have people that pay attention and are following what they're doing on their respective channels. So the show as a social media tool, people were recognizing that. And that's okay. So I mean, the story is being done here by Substream. I understand where they're coming from. Trying to look for real, you know, shocking, memorable performances. So you had stars like Lil Nas X, Olivia Rodrigo, Billy Eilish, Doja Cat, and Chloe Bailey. Presence was consi- conspicuously absent. New albums from Tyler, the creator, Drake and Kanye West, came out with albums recently and not a peep. New School was present with some great performances, but the weirdest thing is that the show felt like something you would bookmark for later. Oh, okay, I'll wait for the clips to hit Twitter on Instagram. Do you mean there, was a be- there wasn't a better way for MTV to pass off the baton to call why it was so important during, while during the keys over to the future? I mean, artists have a more direct line to their fans more than ever before. You could drop a video on a streaming service, YouTube, or TikTok to gain traction. Music leads needs less of an intermediary to provide content to the people. The tools are entirely different. In all honesty, it highlights the ineffectiveness of something like MTV to stay with the times. It will have a niche of people who watch shows like Jersey Shore, Catfish, The Challenge. No cure for those who constantly ask, does MTV even play music anymore? But the intermediary, that's a good way to put it. Because music does need to have that. A way to, as a gateway to bring people to music and let them explore new music. Because ask yourself the question, all the alternative music, everything that we had from Nirvana and Pearl Jam, when everything started changing and all, and, and we were going from glam rock and hard rock into alternative to grunge and the changes that were being made there, you wouldn't have gotten that kind of change without MTV. When it came to MTV being dominant with Prince or Whitney Houston or Janet Jackson, and then the transition into a dance era, and then the transition to hip hop, MTV led the way. And so we were, they, somebody was there that was showcasing the trends that were being set and being on top of what the trends were. There were people that actually did this. And God forbid I say something good about Bob Pittman, the head of iHeartRadio, because he's one of the people, to some, to some extent, he was responsible for creating what is MTV today, what it started as, as a music video channel. Now, more in this story, the writer writes that nothing stays the same forever. If you don't feel like going into a store, Amazon can ship you virtually anything in two days. 
With gaming, you could play with a good group of people in another country and never meet them face to face. We all have a compact computer in our pockets to any access of information. And MTV, well, there's ridiculousness and more ridiculousness. It now feels like you're going to your first home coming after graduating from college college reminiscing about the good times and the old spots you went to but you get a couple of nights to relish in that other people will occupy those same bars dining halls or dorm rooms and wash over the memories of yesterday the gen z consuming music much faster has left what's left of music and mtv behind but he also called mtv being one of the most important beacons of musical entry correct Word of mouth now is where it is. Or some stars that are just up there and unnoticed. But nobody wants to take that job. That's unfortunate. BBC does. Uh, BBC is not even a full thing for, for music. But they have an amazing radio station. <clears throat> or set of radio stations. They are on the pulse of what's dance music. Or what's hip hop. What's everything. Rock? Absolutely. They still play rock music. They still focus. Hell, they're, they're a government-owned entity that funds new artists. And they discover new artists all the time. They do it. And we don't have that here. I don't know. But, you know, that's where we are. It's a shame that we're at this point, but this is why I come down to where we are when it comes to music. It's just a stand, a, a standpoint of there is an MTV effect, but it's not from MTV. But they created an effect of how popular music, of who we look at, because. I mean, I don't know if Drake or Kanye would actually fit the MTV mold. I mean, if Drake were featured all over the place, I think it would draw viewers. But really, how often do you see your favorite musical artists on camera, except on social media? But when you're looking at what everybody's doing, remember the MTV style of how videos or how they used to shoot footage of any show they did. From the wacky graphics to their their sense of sarcasm or their sense of humor and all the things that they did. Let me put it to you like this. So when you look at the early influencers before social media, the influencers were on that TV. Jesse, believe it or not, would have been an influencer in today's age. Polly Shore, Julie Brown, Wubba Wubba. They would have all been influencers today. <laughs> they would have. Kari War at M- Remote Control would have been an influencer. Martha, all the VJs would have been absolutely. I mean, that's that's just how it was. And people don't realize where we have that. And but everything went to social media. Everything went to digital. And so we have people that are out there that do showcase on music, but it's not the traditional likes of MTV because they get corporate owned. Viacom now has MTV as a, as a, as a figment of its former self, eh, but it's been like that for years. Let, let's not completely go ahead and, you know, blow them up. And there were changes that were made because of a corporate entity taking over that decided MTV should not be for music because there was other ways to make money or do something with their channel. Music is a very small portion of what they do and it doesn't get any push doesn't get any marketing doesn't get any promotion they don't just don't care it doesn't matter to them well it's too bad now let's go ahead and move along and talk about drake versus kanye because that's been a very interesting story look at what actually happened all together with that battle so Variety actually wrote about this a couple days ago. Drake crushing Kanye West for 21, 2021's biggest album debut. Only the top 10 songs too. So here it is. Drake's Certified Lover Boy. Top debuting album of the year so far. 539, 595,000 
album equivalent units. And I know it's been over 600,000 more than that by the time I record this tonight. Handily beating the 313,000 album units that Kanye West's Donda claimed when it premiered on the chart last week. And at the time set its own record for a year to date shortly to be toppled. Now Drake landed all 10 of his songs on the Rolling Stone songs chart. On the Billboard chart, 9 of the 10, only Stay, Kid Lowry and Justin Bieber was able to stay in the chart, I think it was number 7. If rivalries could be put aside, rivalries could be put aside, West would have little to complain about, as Donda continues to have a strong pull compared with just about anything but the Drake album. In the second week, it fell to number 2, but still managing 141,600 album units. So Drake sold 43,200 physical copies of the album. He owned the vast majority of the success to a staggering 680.9 million individual streams for its songs. Second week for Donda, 141,000 sales. Of 6,400 physical sales, still estimable 169 million streams. Drake's album enjoyed the benefits of having seven days of sales and streaming going into its debut chart week five for West. He rushed to release his album on a Sunday instead of a Friday. But the gulf between their figures indicate that Drake's leader for West in this derby has to do with a lot more than a two date advantage. Now, besides Drake's debut in the top 10 of the Rolling Stone album chart, Iron Maiden's Senjutsu bowed at number four with 53,000 plus album equivalent units a so-called heritage act now there's others that are in here they're talking about all the albums itself but really it's the domination and we know that there were some shots being taken within the albums of drake and kanye that decided to go after each other and there's a lot to be said about where some people might have criticized certified lover boy for the quality that is compared to previous albums to now. <clears throat> and that overall, it doesn't matter what Drake puts out. If he just puts out an album, it's going to get a lot of play. And sure, there might be some things that maybe people will say that somehow, some way, there was a full inflation of the numbers that were out there about how people were able to go and listen to music and how... Drake was able to dominate as much as it did, but it did sell a lot, and you can't deny that. But it is something to be said about how well everything worked out. But for both of them, it just says so much about everything when it comes around to what they're doing. I mean, you know, the press out there, there's a whole lot of the gossip going on. But I prefer to go and look over everything they did when it comes to how large an impact both of these artists were able to do and what's going on. And, you know, it was really becoming incredible with all that they did. Just got to say. All right. I got a bunch of other stories to go and cover tonight. Let's go ahead and move along. Let me follow up on Shang-Chi and how that's been doing so far. Have not looked at what the numbers looked like so far for that movie, but we should keep an eye on that because obviously that is the reason where we're going to see the box office kind of stay stable and a lot of movies are going to continue to be released as expected. So looking at the weekend chart, Shang-Chi so far, $144 million dollars in two weeks at the box office so no drop off major for that 265 million worldwide massive so now first week was 75 million for the official three-day weekend not the for the, the normal weekend not the labor day weekend where they counted four days 54 percent drop off but 34 million dollars they made on shang chi after that it's like it still made a significant amount of money. Just saying. 
Now let's go into the actual story of Shang-Chi and how it has changed the film distribution strategy because Disney was getting ready to go and start moving movies off to next year, but Shang-Chi ultimately changed things. So now there's an optimistic turn for film exhibition in the U.S., which is contending with the aggressive Delta variant. So there are more movies left in the Disney roster that are left to be put out. The Last Duel, Ron's Gone Wrong, Antlers, Eternals, Encanto, Nightmare Alley, West Side Story, and The King's Man. So now there's a strategy call going to be put in place for Eternals, the next Marvel movie scheduled for November 5th. If Shang-Chi matches the pattern of Free Guy and Candyman by maintaining sufficient gross in a second weekend, Eternals is unlikely to hit Disney+. Plus. So then Disney would not choose to stream it right away concurrent with the exhibition, with the actual release of the movie. So would make it more important for a Marvel's movie to be watched in the theater, which would actually give more reason for the Marvel Universe to come out and congregate for another great Marvel movie that they all expect to watch. Shang-Chi is a new entry to the MCU, but Eternals sports an ensemble cast more akin to the Guardians of the Galaxy films, as well as franchise forefathers, the Avengers, making it more appealing than Shang-Chi, so they should be able to make better money on that movie. Hybrid film releasing. So, releasing simultaneously streaming or exhibition or the movie theater has accounted a bit of a reckoning. We've all talked about that. Global piracy, the Scar Scarlett Johansson lawsuit. Now, unlike Eternals, the animated film Encanto, a new IP, could most likely be shifted to go ahead and be only on Disney Plus or simultaneously on Disney Plus. Now, the delay of Top Gun Maverick to November 2022, from November to 2022, may have removed one film from the competition heading to Thanksgiving, but then Ghostbusters Afterlife took the spot. And that, that Ghostbusters movie is going to go up against Encanto. So they want to make sure that families can go and watch a good animated movie during the holidays, a new feature. In December, Disney may need to push one film back because they have a lot of movies that are scheduled to come out. So Steven Spielberg's West Side Story will get a head start ahead of a pile of films closer to Christmas. You got Spider-Man Far From Home, The Matrix Resurrections, Sing 2, and The King's Man. Which was originally scheduled uh, for earlier for late August. It would have been actually have already run. The film's an R-rated prequel to the two prior Kingsman films. Better suited for the early months than the December holiday, especially with the Matrix franchise making its return. And given how poorly the Suicide Squad fared for the DC Universe in August, Disney's case-by-case -case approach appears to be the right call for the studio. So by not doing the simultaneous streaming, Suicide Squad did not do well in the box office as a result. Because that just went right to HBO Max, and there's no extra money being made on that, unlike Disney Plus with their premium price. So everybody is starting to think now there might be some movies that might go to streaming because it's more for the family, but they're not going to go use streaming as the primary way of making money on the movies, which is fantastic. I'm glad they're doing that. That's going to work out. Another story I brought up last week was the IATSE. The International Association of Theatrical Stage Employees. We talked about that last week here on the program. Well, there's more to be said about that. The rap.com put a story out about how talks between IATSE and studios have reached a critical juncture. And at the president, of the of the IATSE's calling for combined solidarity as Hollywood's workers 
among Hollywood workers, a threat, as a threat of threat of strike looms. God, I can't get that out of my mouth. The exact timetable of when a strike authorization vote might be presented is unclear. The Guild of the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, the AMPTP, representing the studios, failed to come to terms on a new bargaining agreement prior to the September 10th deadline, but continue to operate under the previous agreement as talks continue. But if the talks fall apart, we're going to strike. Guild insiders say that while there's concern among members about a strike that would leave them without income shortly after a pandemic shutdown, putting them out for months, the general consensus now is that the best opportunity to achieve long-sought labor goals is now. So they want to get a limit on shooting hours to avoid 14-hour workdays and shoots Extending into the weekend has led to serious physical and mental fatigue in some situations leading to that could have led to preventable accidents. IATSE. Uh, there's also the there's also pay disparity that's also being talked about. Despite immense profits for studios, thanks to new streaming services like Disney Plus and Peacock, and a surge of demand for productions to provide new movies and TV shows for those streamers. So the members have been reached out to make them aware of a potential strike authorization vote which would not immediately trigger a strike, but give the Guild's bargaining committee more leverage. If the mega corporations that make up the MPTP remain unwilling to address the core priorities and treat workers with human dignity, it is going to take the combined solidarity of all of us to change their minds. That's from the IATSE president, Matthew J. Lowe. So we're now into this very heady territory. So could there be a strike in Hollywood that could affect a lot of content and hold stuff back? Sure, could be. So we'll wait and see what happens with it. But it's a story we want to continue on because it is quite interesting how how everything works out when it comes to all this. Okay, I want to take another story that was very interesting to me that if you were watching last week, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this until after because I didn't actually bring it up when I watched the uh, football game, the season opener of the NFL. But if you're watching NFL programming, you're seeing commercials for sports books. This is interesting to me that now sports books are allowed to go and promote and advertise on air. So sports books spent over $24 million on ads during the first week of the NFL and a sign of things to come. Gambling was the six biggest ad categories of the weekend during NFL programming. The league's sportsbook partners and advertisers brought 90 total advertising units across NFL games on CBS, Fox, and NBC this past week. The majority of ads ran during nationally televised games such as Thursday Night Football and Sunday Night Football. FanDuel, the most overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly biggest advertiser, they trailed only Geico, Progressive, and Interact TV in terms of overall, overall ad units. DraftKings, FanDuel, and Caesars Entertainment are all official sportsbook partners of the NFL. But then there are other sportsbooks that are allowed to advertise as well. BetMGM led the way amongst other sportsbooks, being the only other one who bought in-game advertising. Dropping $2.7 million for nine ads, seven of which aired during Sunday afternoon on CBS. The Supreme Court struck down the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act of 2018 because now almost half of the U.S. population can now legally bet on sports in their state. And numbers are only going to grow each year. year. If anything, the concerns will be how to manage the messaging so that viewers are not inundated with sports betting ads. Networks have been given the discretion to run up to six gambling ads per game. which usually comes out to one during pregame, one per quarter, and one at halftime. So that's going to be a thing now, ongoing, that gambling is a major portion of advertising across. And it's just it's not just the fact they're going to have gambling out there. It's that it's the draw that live sports needs to keep people viewed. Because remember, for the networks, it's a chance for them to continue to have people watching their programming. And for the most part, Thursday Night Football, Monday Night Football, had quite a bit of extra viewership this time around. $26 million for Thursday night and $15 million for Monday night. 
And I think what's going to happen is we're going to get a lot more people watching because they got some money on it. Just saying. Because now it's going to be much more easier for the layman viewer to get involved and have another reason to go and watch what's going on. That's what's coming on right there. So I got a few other things I want to bring up here. Let's go into a study that I found that was interesting about the adoption of streaming accelerating. The fact of how many people are more prone to streaming media. Futuri. They put on a number of talking points about what's going on right now in terms of streaming. Some of their findings include audiences dramatically accelerating adoption of streaming, social subscriptions, and esports. Amidst voracious consumer appetite for content, majority of local TV outlets are dependent on social media for sourcing these stories and content for their audiences. Media executives don't feel confident in their company's ability to adopt advancing technologies to meet the needs of consumers. And consumer trust in news media is reaching new lows as social media becomes more prominent source for pandemic-related news. Futury is a leading provider of AI-driven audience engagement and sales intelligence solutions for media. And they went through a lot of their things that they put up. So they explored five key verticals, TV, social media, digital publishing, radio, and esports. Sports and betting. Seriously, so key findings that they found, and I think some of these are really fascinating to talk about, which really talk about the digital disruption that I always talk about on this show. So let's break them down. America's insatiable appetite for uh, appetite for content. Forty-one percent of consumers are consuming ten hours of content plus a week. An average monthly cost of streaming bills of forty-five dollars. So streaming, it's just out there. Average consumer. 10 plus hours it's accessible it's available and you know they're 45 dollars a monthly bills on average compared to spending over 100 dollars on cable there you go you see what the digital disruption is doing audience is getting news outside of traditional channels 47 percent of americans turn to google google every week for their news flanked by facebook youtube instagram and twitter I look at Google for a lot of stuff myself. National newspaper websites like New York Times, Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and U.S. Today capture only 19% of Americans, the minority. So it just tells you that, you know, if you decide to go ahead and not just give the information and let people disseminate from it as without having an agenda, then people are going to do that. You can't control what news is delivered to people. People now have the option to find it wherever they want, everywhere else. That's all there is to it. Trust the media at all time lows. No surprise. A majority of Americans do not trust major TV outlets. Of the organizations analyzed, they analyzed CBS, CNN, NBC, ABC, PBS, Fox, Fox News, MSNBC, and Newsmax. None were trusted by more than half of the respondents. Credibility scores ranging from 30 to 47 percent and decreasing for young Americans to 23 to 34 percent. Yeah. Because people are now opening their eyes to the fact that what news is being given on these media outlets, major TV outlets, mass media, it's not any good. They've now learned what the game and how it's been played. We've all opened our eyes. And back in January, I said I was going to swear myself off of watching news. All those channels, and I've done it. I'm telling you, if you do that yourself, and you decide to go and think for yourself, you decide to go and find the information for yourself, and go looking, I mean, it just makes you feel better. I mean, it just makes you, it relieves you of any anxiety or the kind of depression that can be put on there. Listen, we know that things are bad. Well, there's a lot of things that are bad out there. We know politicians are whores and they're not doing anything for anybody. 99% of them. All we hope for is that these people that are in power, these civil servants, if you will, they don't screw things up, but they do anyway, don't they? People that are not voted into power, they get to play chess with the world because we're American. We can do that. 
And the news, you know, there's a reason why everybody's all worried about where well, every company in America now, just because the president said, oh, that all these major companies have to go ahead and get their employees vaccinated. All they needed to do was just put the thought in the mind of these companies. And here's the thing, without even having to go ahead and make these companies do anything. I mean, it's the threat that everybody gets all scared about. But you know what the real thing is, is that the companies, they decide to do it themselves because they want to avoid liability because their insurance or their liability types, they're going to say, you know what? You need to go and do this. You need to get this done. Without any, any thought about it. I don't care. I'm vaccinated. I'm just pointing out the fact that hypocrisy or everything. That's what it comes down to. I mean, because nobody's paying attention to them. The, the, all those, all those three letter outlets. No, nobody cares anymore. Doesn't matter. Social leads is a source for pandemic related news. So America's are winning off mainstream TV. So the major TV outlets, they range between 31 and 52%. 31 to 52%. In contrast, Facebook grabs 64% of Americans, YouTube 61%, and other platforms, including TikTok, Snapchat, and Instagram, 48%. There you go. Social media, people are getting their news, their information, their entertainment from there. The digital disruption. And there's no answer from the mainstream corporatized media types, the traditional media, counterculture rules. That's what's happening. They're the majority now. Journalists are turning to social. Large majority of journalists and producers for local TV stations are using social media to source new stories and content for the readers. Yeah, they can't do actual reporting anymore. They're hamstrung for what they're allowed to do. So they can't do anything now. Uh oh. Esports and gaming audiences are good targets for sports media. Sports betting now legalized in more states. Nearly two three two thirds of Americans plan to bet on regular season, playoff, or championship sporting events. That's just good for sports. And it's live. And that's one of the few things that are live on traditional television that is still thriving. That's all they have left. This past Monday night. You know, ESPN has been the sole place for Monday Night Football. They did do a special broadcast now with the Manning brothers doing on ESPN too. But then also the show, the, the, the game was also simulcast on ABC. When every time there's a major event on ESPN, they put on ABC because ABC has nothing else. They don't have any real content that's going to compel people to come back and add 10, 20 million viewers to watch something on their channel. There isn't anything. They're basically building up content for their own service, which would probably be Disney Plus. And it'll just be housed there. But, you know, people are not going to be watching the ABC programming on Disney Plus, more or less. They're going to be watching the Marvel content or whatever Disney Plus has that's being done by Disney Plus exclusively for Disney Plus. Media executives are nervous about the future. 88% agree attracting and retaining talent as a priority, but only 56% feel confident in the industry's ability to do it 85 percent agree it's important to attract younger audiences yeah the next generation but they can't now 47 percent feel confident in the industry's ability to do so and for whatever reason they say broadcast radio remains resilient 65 percent of households with one hundred thousand dollars or more they depend on radio for their pandemic news Demonstrating the medium's importance for updates on COVID-19. You know, where are they getting that from? The poll was studied. That it was The poll included 2,000 Americans between the ages of 16 to 74 and nearly 200 media executives across the country specializing in TV, radio, digital publishing. Yeah, there's your part about the broadcast radio resiliency. Bullshit. But the focus group of 2,000 Americans, it's not too bad. That's actually uh, not too bad right there for the, for the most part. So anyway, we're going to leave it all there. We're going to go ahead and move along. And I had a few other stories I had left. I'll just pull those over to the next week. Confessions of an early career journalist in the industry. The evolution of the music industry and what it means for marketing yourself as a musician. 
and audio undergoing a renaissance and odyssey explains why so that's all part of what i'm going to put out for next week's show and i'll take that oh there's so much more god i didn't realize i forgot what else i had i also had other stories i didn't have get the chance to get to the future tv news will not be on tv and tune in whatever you want how tv marketing has changed in the on-demand era so those stories i'm going to hold off to next week because i'm out of time 60 minutes up and done we'll leave it there thank you for listening to the program as you always do i really do appreciate all of you checking on the show each and every week and more importantly come back next week and do let other people know about the program however you like and just reach out to us you know I hope you like what I've been doing with the programming. I know more people have been listening to the show. I'm glad to see that. And I hope you like where I'm coming from, where, you know, we really do try to break it down. Start off with the things that people would, the most people will care about. And then I go more to the business side of it, kind of like move along. And hopefully a lot of you will stick around the program to hear more of all these great analysis and all these different things that are going on in the wonderful world of media. Okay, I'm going to leave it there until next week. Remember that content is king and the control of your content is in your hands. Thank you for listening to the Broadcasters Podcast. Find all the links to subscribe to the show by going to broadcasterspodcast.com. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program, the Wrestling is Real Podcast, exclusively at wrestlingisreal.com. 